If you have an asset that has a lot of debt left on it and you are being allowed to pass the full costs on and recover the full cost from your rate payers, regardless of how much revenue you're making back, you have a really strong incentive to keep that plant online and to continue to make money on it because it doesn't matter if you're losing money or making money on it in the market. These utilities are being allowed by the state commissions to charge the ratepayers for basically their full cost of operating and owning these plants. So Jeannie, who's our guest on the Energy Nerd Show today? Today we have Debbie Glick from Synapse Energy Economics. How are those OVEC plants? What's OVEC again? OVEC stands for the Ohio Valley Electric Corporation. It is a corporation that was formed in the 1950s by about 12 public utilities and electric cooperatives when the U.S. Department of Energy needed a power plant to provide power to a uranium enrichment facility that they were building, the Piketon Uranium Enrichment Facility in Portsmouth, Ohio. So they said, we need this power. And they asked a bunch of public utilities in the region. They said, can you build us a power plant that's going to provide power to us? And so they did. And that's how OVEC started in the 50s. And then? Yeah. So 50 years, things were pretty good. The power plant operated, it provided power to the uranium enrichment facility. And then in 2003, the Department of Energy decided they did not need the facility anymore. And they basically gave the plant back to the owners. And then the owners essentially had to figure out what to do with it. So they started using the power from it. And where our story really begins is in 2011, when the owners signed the current operating agreement to provide power, the energy and capacity from the power plants to 13 what's called sponsoring companies, basically regional utilities that essentially locks in these utilities to the power plant through about 2040. So for the next 25 years or more, and these power plants will be 85 years old at that time, which is quite old for anything, especially for a power plant. They were used to send electricity to a uranium facility, but they're not nuclear plants. What are they fueled by? They are coal plants. So there's two different coal plants. So even though the whole corporation is called the Ohio Valley Electric Corporation, it's two power plants. So Clifty Creek and Kyger Creek. One of them is located in Indiana. One of them is in Ohio. They're 1,300 megawatts and about 1,100 megawatts. So they're, they're very large, but as I said, they're very old. They're quite inefficient. And yeah, they provide power to 13 what's called sponsoring companies that then you know sell this power to the grid and use it to provide power to their customers. So, so for the first half a century, what they did was make sure that the nuclear generation happening at nearby plants was not actually zero carbon. They're burning coal, generating CO2 in order to run and produce fuel for the nuclear plants. And now in more recent years, what they're doing is they're representing that small set of old, lousy coal units that are older than Bruce and continue to operate rather than retire. So, you know, they're bringing bringing honor and pride to the oldest, smallest, most inefficient plants in the fleet. These plants, I said they're owned by a bunch of regional utilities. Like the biggest owners are American Electric Power Company, AEP owns about 45%, 43% Duke Energy, First Energy, which has been in the news for bankruptcy, AES. So it's owned by a lot of really large regional utilities. The interesting thing is they all own like a small portion. So it ranges between about half a percent up to like 43% for AEP. And there's a lot of debt left on these plans. So like there's still a lot of money to pay off. These owners have an interest in paying off a lot of money on these plants. But if you look at the sponsoring companies, so the companies that essentially pay for the power from these plants, they are across two different RTOs, so MISO and PJM. They represent about 5% of total U.S. electricity customers. So that literally means that approximately 5% of the U.S. electricity customers across six states are in some way, shape, or form paying for these really old plants. And that's problematic because... They're very expensive to operate and very inefficient. And really, if these plants were owned by what's called a merchant generator, like a, a, an owner that just had to bid a power plant into the market and would only operate them if they made enough money from the market, if they were owned by a merchant generator, they probably would have been shut down back in 2003 when the DOE gave them up. So it's literally because they have rate payers as a backstop that they're still online. That's terrible. Well, is it really common for plants this old to still have a lot of debt? It seems like if it was built that long ago, I mean, what have they been doing to keep, you know, the debt up? 
So they keep investing in the plant. I am not an expert, partially because they keep that stuff very close to the chest. So we have only been able to get very limited information on like what constitutes their debt structure, how they're paying and all that's highly confidential. So like we can't even really talk about the specifics of it. Um, but what is public is that they're trying to pay it off quite quickly. So I think they see the writing is on the wall that they're probably going to be forced to retire this plant. And so the majority of the debt comes due in the next 10 years, even though they have plans to continue to operate the plant for more than 20 years. So if you have an asset that has a lot of debt left on it, and you are being allowed to pass the full costs on and recover the full cost from your ratepayers, regardless of how much revenue you're making back, you have a really strong incentive to keep that plant online and to continue to make money on it. Because it doesn't matter if you're losing money or making money on it in the market, these utilities are being allowed by the state commissions to charge the ratepayers for basically their full cost of operating and owning these plants. So the companies are doing a thing that wastes customer money and emits excessive carbon for no good reason, but the company's incentives line up to have them do that. So then whose fault is it that this continues? So it's a lot of people's fault. So it's admittedly a very complicated regulatory structure. So normally you have power plants that are either owned by merchant operators and they earn money in the market or they don't. And if they don't, they retire because it's a private company. Or you have power plants that are fully owned by public utilities that are regulated by a regulatory commission. And in that case, the regulatory commission can see, you know, what are the fuel costs that this plant is incurring and how is it being operated and what are the environmental costs in this case, because of this really complicated regulatory structure, it's across six different states, 12 owners, 13 basically sponsoring companies, everyone plays hot potato. So even though they're all the companies technically are on what's called an operating committee and they're all on planning committees, they all have a say. All the companies claim, oh, well, we can't make a unilateral decision. We can't shut the plant down. We can't do anything. And the regulators are having a really hard time understanding and seeing what's going on. And it's really only through intervention through the parties that Synapse works for that we've been able to sunlight and pull out information and make clear how expensive these plants are compared to the market, how much it is a bad deal for ratepayers. So it's a lot of people's fault, but I would say it's mostly the utilities because, you know, at best, the utilities are doing a really poor job operating this plant. And at worst, the cynical person in me says they're taking advantage of the complicated regulatory structure and the fact that it's very hard to regulate these plants. Yeah, I've noticed that companies like AEP and Duke have a lot of you know, political clout and they, they have quite a few lawyers. And if they want to do a thing, they can you know, often figure out a way to, to do it. Yeah, dockets we work in are mostly in Michigan. We, I mean, Synapse, mostly in Michigan and Ohio. And the interesting thing in Ohio is that there was a House bill, HB6, that was passed that actually walks in and provides revenue to the OVEC plant. So it's called a legacy generation rider. And so it, it locks in for the next decade, 2020 to 2030, basically the costs of operating the plant. So it's a financial hedge in Ohio. It's a little different than in Michigan. So it's not like the power is being directly procured for the customers, but rather the Ohio utilities, AEP, Duke, and Dayton Power and Light are basically being guaranteed that they will be able to recover the full energy and demand charges that they are being charged by OVAC. They can pass those on to the rate payers for the next decade. And in years when they make money, that's great for rate payers. And in years when they lose money, that's bad for rate payers. But on um, Newsflash, they lose money literally every year. The only year they have not lost money was 2022 because of the crazy energy market prices and high gas prices. And the magnitude of money that these plants lose in the market are like hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And they've made maybe $80 million in 2022. So losing hundreds of millions of dollars for a decade and earning $80 million in one year doesn't exactly balance out. You said, Debbie, that these are some of the oldest coal plants um, you know, from the 50s. And that, you know, in, in America, coal plants have been retiring especially the older ones. So can, can you put that in context, please? So I basically pulled data from the Energy Information Administration on all of the current and retired coal plants in the United States. Everything in black is a retired coal plant. Everything in yellow is a coal plant that does not have a scheduled retirement date. Everything in gray does. And then these red guys are OVEC. 
this is just giving you an idea of, you know, most of the older ones are retired or at least have scheduled retirement dates. And to hone in on it here, I I took the retired ones out. You can see that the OVAC plants are the oldest, basically large plants, maybe anything more than 20 megawatts that do not have a scheduled retirement date in the United States. So like all of these other gray ones over here, I think are like Tennessee Valley Authority. Everything else this old has either been retired or has a retirement date. The OVEC plants are the oldest ones in the U.S. without an announced retirement date, which is just totally bonkers. Yeah, so most of their peers from that decade and even the early 60s are, are, are retired by now. And, and, and the ones that aren't, most of them are, have scheduled retirement dates. So just a handful sticking around for their own, uh, their own funny reasons. Yeah, I mean, if I had a car from the 1950s, it might be cool to look at, but I certainly wouldn't rely on it for my day-to-day. And uh, these things are still being relied on. These antique plants are being relied on for day-to-day, and they're not quite so charming as an antique car. (laughs) So, Debbie, with all this debt, if somehow people are successful in shutting down these plants, who's going to pay for all that remaining debt? So not ratepayers. So there are 12 companies that are shareholder. Essentially, they are the owners and their shareholders will be responsible for the debt. It will not be passed on. Obviously, you can have corruption. You can have, you know, another Ohio bill where they're bailed out and the costs are paid. But in an ideal world and what's currently set up to happen is that the shareholders of ADP, Duke, AES, First Energy, all the other companies, their shareholders will pay the debt. Well, I'm just thinking if ratepayers are losing, you know, $100 million every year, there's got to be even, I'm not proposing that there should be some negotiation, but it seems like there's got to be a middle ground where these guys could be convinced somehow, or I guess it just has to be the commissions, right? Yeah. And so this is the tricky thing is, you know, when I say they're losing hundreds of millions a year, what I mean there is when OVEX sells power, it sells it for an energy charge and a demand charge. And then that power is sold back into the market. And so when I say that they are losing money, what I mean is that the demand charges and the energy charges are higher than the revenue that a company can earn in you know, the PJM or MISO energy markets and capacity markets. Um, and so part of the issue is that, that we tend to get into disputes with the company about what exactly the value of the energy and capacity is and whether replacement resources or other options would be cheaper. And fortunately in Michigan, the commission has agreed with us, has sided with us. So we've now done, I think, six dockets in Michigan for Sierra Club and the Michigan Attorney General. And the Michigan commission has actually issued a disallowance, 1.3 million disallowance, essentially saying, you are not allowed to charge your rate payers above market value. We agree with Attorney General and Sierra Club that OVAC power is more expensive than an alternative. And an, an interesting thing in Michigan is that they have what's called a code of conduct. So the company that we file these dockets in, it's Indiana Michigan Power Company. They're owned by AEP, American Electric Power. It's one of the major owners of OVEC. So they are their affiliates. And in Michigan, you cannot profit off of ratepayers to send that profit to an affiliate entity. And so the reason that in Michigan we were able to get these disallowances is because the commission agreed with us that Indiana, Michigan is an affiliate with OVEC and the power is more expensive than market. And then therefore the ratepayer should not have to pay this. That's great. I wonder if the other states have affiliate um, code of conduct. I don't think they do. And actually, Ohio has been very challenging. So I submitted testimony in two dockets in Ohio back last year in the winter and spring. The commission still has not issued an order in those two dockets from, I think, January and and June. I'm currently filing testimony in two more dockets. And just to get the commission to issue an order to schedule a hearing took a long time and it required public pressure from some of the local groups putting pressure on the commission to actually schedule a hearing and you know basically allow due process to happen. So it's been a little challenging in Ohio. And actually in Ohio, an interesting thing is last year, one of the dockets, once again, American Electric Power Company, their company in Ohio, the auditor, which is London Economics, had actually tried to put in their audit some really interesting findings, including that it was probably in the best interest of ratepayers to not operate the plant. And the Public Utility Commission staff in Ohio actually asked the auditor to tone down the language and uh, basically remove it, which does not sound so kosher. (laughs) Wow. Really doesn't. What about other states? Are there advocates in other states that are also paying for this that are starting to fight it? 
So I don't know as much about what's going on in other states. So Michigan is generally a slightly friendlier regulatory environment. And so that's why a lot of these cases have been going on in Michigan. So there's also a bunch of ownership in Indiana. I don't know as much about what is going on and what can be done outside of Michigan and Ohio, unfortunately. But the reason we're so excited about this docket, the the ruling in Michigan of the $1.3 million disallowance is that Indiana Michigan Power Company, the ratepayers in Michigan are a very small portion of their total ratepayers. So most of their ratepayers are in Indiana. So the Michigan ratepayers technically are only responsible for like, I think, 1% of the OVEC plant through Indiana, Michigan. So if you scale up the disallowance that we got in Michigan to like the total plant, that would be like over a hundred million dollars. So we only got 1 million, but if every commission agreed with us, the implications of that are over a hundred million dollars disallowance, which means that that is why the numbers I was saying before are that these plants are losing, you know, hundreds of millions a year. Somebody needs to tell the Indiana advocates. Well, it seems like a complicated situation and the states are a mixed bag with regard to addressing this. Is there a federal role? I mean, it seems like there ought to be a law. In this environment where we're trying to reduce carbon emissions or passing rules like the 111 rule regulating power plants, and, you know, we're we're trying to reduce carbon emissions, we're talking about how much it's going to cost. Here's an opportunity to stop wasting money and reduce carbon emissions. I mean, it's particularly uh, outrageous. And do we have some federal uh, intervention in this to to, um, impose some common sense? I mean, I would hope so. I know that with the most recent, you know, 111G regulations that the greenhouse gas standards that were just proposed, those would restrict how this plant operates going forward because it's currently planned to operate through at least 2040. At a minimum, they'd have to co-fire with natural gas starting in 2030. So they would have to make a change. These are very old, small plants that would make them even less efficient than they currently are. It would be expensive to upgrade them. I don't know if there's even natural gas infrastructure near those plants. So because this was just proposed, I, I haven't had any time to look into like what that would actually cost, the feasibility of it. The owners did recently invest a lot of money in complying with some of the coal combustion residuals and effluent limitation guideline rules of the plants. And because complicated regulatory environment, they don't have to get approval from anyone. They just spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, but they are also trying to get waivers at some of their plants and they've been denied waivers. So they're just a giant mess. They're basically spending tens and hundreds of millions of dollars and trying to get waivers and being denied waivers. And all of this is happening in this like back rooms where they're trying to keep everybody from actually seeing what's happening. So they only throw good money after bad and, and don't really, um, it goes on because it's not their money. It's not their money. Is there anything else that we should talk about while we're here? I guess I should, like, in the interest of full disclosure, conflict of interest, I did go to University of Michigan, so I am a Michigan Wolverine. So, like, I generally, it's like, I hate all things Ohio. It's not why I'm going after these plants. I don't actually hate Ohio. So, you know, I just want to be totally clear on that. This is totally based on economics. (laughs) This isn't personal. Do you want to shout out to anybody, any um, clients or anybody else that's working on this? or? Oh, yeah. I've done a lot of work with Sierra Club. Their lawyers there are awesome. And Chris Bizdock, their outside counsel, has been working on these cases for years. The Ohio Consumer Council, I've done a bunch of work in Ohio with them, Union of Concerned Scientists and Citizen Utility Board, and the Michigan Attorney General. So like you can tell by that diverse list, there's like environmental advocates, consumer advocates, consumer protection. It's like a whole range of groups that are interested. And there's just like dozens of people So like, this is such a massive like group effort that's been going on. There's not like one person that really can take credit for any of these wins. It's, you know, and Synapse too, you know, thought leadership on and how this works. It's just been a group effort to try to get these plants off of ratepayers' bills. If people want to learn more, where should they go? We're going to have a blog about this. Yeah. Read the blog. (laughs) Read the blog. And I should make an OVEC page for the website that that, like connects to all these different dockets because there's been uh, 10 different dockets that we've done or are currently involved in that involve these plants. It seems like there might be a few more. Well, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day, guys. You too. Thanks, you too.